Thank you. Good morning. Kind of early, huh? Um, so I understand that, was it last week you had former Secretary of State Ralph Monroe here? Wow. So, so Ralph's a friend also of, of mine and Jeff's. And so Ralph is what I'd call a natural speaker. He was born speaking. So if you heard Ralph last week, he's one of those guys. I'm not one of those guys. I'm one of those guys who's had to really work at communication and public speaking because it scared the heck out of me when I was your age and even beyond. And now I do it in my job all the time. So I'm not like Ralph, but I've worked at it a long time. So if Ralph told you something last week and I say something different, whatever he said goes, OK? All right. So um, I thought what I'd do today is talk a little bit about my job at the city and about how public, uh, public speaking and communication are really critical to what I do. It's really all I do. When, when my kids were little, they'd say, Dad, what do you do? I said, well, I go to meetings, and um, I'm on the phone a lot. So, so really, I'm communicating all day long in my job. So it's really critical that I worked at it to get pretty decent at it. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my job and how public speaking and communication are critical. Uh, I'd share with you kind of four different types of public speaking that I do, and um, a little bit about how I plan and prepare for each of those, because I think that's really important for someone who's not a natural speaker to be able to plan for that. And then I thought I would uh, wrap up with a few fabulous flops and lessons that I learned from that. So, um, so before I do that, so who, who are you? What are you all studying? Are there any public administration, business administration types in here? OK, a few of those. Communications, media people in here. OK, sciences. OK, a lot of science people. Oh, scientists. OK, yeah, scientists. <laughs> what else? What are, what are some other things you're studying? Besides that I didn't hit on. Engineering? OK. So my, my daughter just graduated with an English degree from Western Washington University. It's one of those degrees you say, well, what do you do with that? But from the day she started that, I said, you know, if you can learn to communicate, you can do anything. You can do engineering. You can do sciences. You can do media, communications, business administration. It's really critical to what we do. So in the city, I have engineers. I don't think I have scientists. Maybe I have scientists. I have a lot of engineers. I have a lot of very technical people. And one of the biggest barriers that I, they have doing their job is learning to communicate, learning to speak, and learning to work in groups especially. So um, let me tell you about my job. So I'm the chief executive officer of the city of Olympia. So I'm the city manager, which means I work for seven elected officials, the mayor and six other city council members, and they elect me to run their business. So their business is public works like streets and water and sewer, parks department, planning, fire, police. So essentially, all those people work directly for me. I have 550 employees. They work directly or indirectly for me. I have a $106 million budget. And so the city council hires me to run their business. So I, I'm kind of like Donald Trump, except uh, no, no casino, and I got a little better hair than Donald Trump. Um, my, my daughter says, I'm the man. She says, whenever the, in Olympia we have protests from time to time, she said, Dad, they're out there raging against the man. I said, yeah. And she goes, Dad, you are the man. I said, oh, I hate it when they do that. So, so I'm, I'm the city manager in Olympia. And so my job is to run the business of the capital city. Um, so, so in my business, uh, there are about f at least four types of speaking that I do. And um, they're very different. So before I launch into those, as I go through these examples, Feel free to ask questions or jump in. I, I'm, I don't have a lot of, a lot of my communication isn't where I stand and talk for half an hour and then people wait till the end. A lot of my communication is interactive with people. And so uh, feel free to ask a question if you'd like or feel free to add something. So the four types of communication that I participate in a lot are ceremonial. So a lot of times I'm representing the city. Sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's not so fun. I'm the spokesperson for the city, and I've got to say something on behalf of the capital city. So there are different ways I prepare for that. Another part of, of, speech, of speaking that I do in communication is motivational. So you can imagine when you have 550 employees, and budgets are tight, and there are cutbacks, and, and sometimes government isn't the most popular, that motivating employees especially, or motivating the public, is a big part of my job. So I also do motivational speaking. Um, a lot of my job is extemporaneous, where on the spot, I've got to engage in a conversation or make a statement or represent the city in some way. So a lot of it is just on the spot. 
And that's a skill that's a little harder to learn, but with practice, you can get pretty good at that. That's one I was not very good at. You know, I was a planner. I would think through my presentations. I'd think through my audience. I'd, I'd, I'd watch for cues. And so the extemporaneous is another one that I've, I've learned to deal with. And then the final one is persuasive, where I'm trying to sell something. I'm trying to convince the city council to pass um, a policy or new law. So for example, this month I'll be talking to the city council about a new ordinance in downtown Olympia that doesn't allow people to panhandle next to our parking meters and next to ATM machines. So I'll be selling. I'll be in my selling mode. So that's a little different kind of communication that I do. So any questions about those so far? Again, they may not be in your outline that way, your textbook, but I think they'll be similar to things you're studying in this class. OK. Um, so let's talk a little bit about ceremonial. This is where I'm the spokesperson for the city, and I've got to make some remarks on behalf of the city. So one of the best examples is um, two Saturdays ago, March 26th, one Saturday ago, last Saturday, a week ago Saturday, we had the grand opening for the new Olympia City Hall. Did anybody come? Oh, it's fabulous. It's fabulous. Something we've been working on for 20 years. So part of my job was to present in front of a crowd. We probably had 200 to 250 people crowded in the new council chambers to see the new city hall. And so part of my job was to be part of the program. And so I know one of the things you're talking about is listening. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you something I think is important. It's important to listen to your audience even before you see them, even before you get in the room. So I knew that a lot of these people were just coming to see the building, have cake, and tour the building. But to get there, they got to go through me. They got to get through the mayor. They got to get through the representative of the governor. So there's all this speechifying. So part of my listening was to understand that these people had motivations that weren't to listen to me for a long time. And so I was trying to figure out how I would present that in a way that was both getting my job done, which is to acknowledge a bunch of people who helped us build that new city hall, but at the same time recognize that these folks wanted to get onto the cake in the tour. So part of, part of it is, uh, like I say, planning, to, listening to your audience before you even get there and thinking about what is it that they want, what is it that they need. Um, so anyhow, the, the city council chambers are opening. We've got 250 people all sitting there. They've heard from the mayor. They've heard from a representative from the governor. They've heard from the current Secretary of State, Stan Reed. My job is to acknowledge about 50 people who did really good things for, to get that building open. So I wanted to use, I know one of the things you're studying is to find a theme. When you're making a presentation, what's your theme? What's, what's your, uh, your message that kind of hangs everything together? So this is March 26th. So what's happening on March 26th? What else in the world is happening on March 26th? Any basketball fans? March Madness. March Madness. That was my theme. March Madness, right? I'm sure not everybody got it in the room. But March Madness. So, so the first thing I talked about, my theme was March Madness. And I said, to get this building ready for you, we've had a little bit of our own March Madness. We had to get 90,000 square feet of office building ready. We had to get furniture. We had to get all the details of carpeting paint ready for you. So we've had our own version of March Madness here in the city. And my job is to share with you 50 people who helped make that possible, 50 people who were critical. And if you're watching the NCAA tournament, they call those people game changers. Those are the players who changed the game, the people who took the great shot, the people who, who really pushed their team. So I said, I'm going to list the game changers in this tournament who really made it possible for us to have this fabulous building. So I kind of wove this NC2A March Madness theme through my presentation to try and help it hang together in the minds of people who just wanted to eat cake and go for a tour. And then at the end, the last thing I did was to acknowledge my MVP, my most valuable player, who is our project manager, who has lived and breathed this project for more than two years. He's, he's been there day in and day out to make it happen. And so I announced him at the end as the MVP of the building grand opening. So, so that's an example of where I took a kind of a boring, dry sort of thing. Not everybody wanted to hear the names of all the people I was listing, but it was important to get it out. And to give them a theme, I used March Madness to try and cement that in their head. Now, if they aren't basketball fans, I don't know if it worked or not. But, but that's one thing. Um, so that's kind of a ceremonial role where I'm representing the city, where I'm speaking on behalf of the city. And I do that a lot. Uh, let me give you another example. So this is where I represent the city in, in not nearly as fun a capacity. Um, quite often, there are issues, problems in, in a city organization, in any government. 
And so often I'm the person who has to be the spokesperson. So early March, we had four people come to the city council on a Tuesday night, and they're angry. They're upset, and they're um, looking for somebody to go after because they became aware of an incident that happened in the city jail in 2008. In 2008, um, we arrested a, a woman in downtown Olympia who was misbehaving. She had been thrown out of the family support center and had some aggressive fighting behaviors. We arrested her, brought her to the jail. And as part of the jail um, process, you have to change from your regular clothes into jail clothes. And this woman refused to do it, got into fighting stances, yelling at the jailers, refusing to cooperate. So we end up tasering this woman, right? We tasered this lady. So if, you, if ever, anybody been tasered? <laughs> Not going to admit it, huh? It's a bad thing. If you've, if you've uh, I've watched them use the taser, not on people, but on a corkboard, and it's scary just on a corkboard. So it's a very traumatic, very um, uh, violent sort of thing to taser someone. So of course we tasered this young lady, and then she decided she would go ahead and change in the jail clothes. Of course, it makes you very compliant. So these people came to the city council, and they were angry. How could the city taser an, a, a a person who's already in jail and, and use that kind of violence against a person. And the reason it came up is because even though the incident happened in 2008, the lawsuit by this woman and her attorney had gotten, just gotten filed. So people are angry. So my job is to respond. Now, I didn't have to respond until the next week. It came up in public communication. I had a week to think about it. So I had to think about it. I had to plan for how would I respond? How would I be the spokesperson for the city in a situation like this? So one of the first things I'm doing is listening to what I heard. So what did I hear? The angry over this violent incident, anger over uh, it being a, a female and a male, a male jailer, um, concern about the policies and practices in our jail, concern about whether they could happen again. So I had a week to prepare for my response. So next week at the city council on live television, I had to respond. So what's the first thing you'd say? What's the first thing one of you would say? If you had to respond on behalf of the city, what would you say first? Yeah, go there. Mm -hmm. It's un definitely unfortunate. Anything else? First thing I said, we're sorry. We are sorry. Um, this is not an incident that should have happened. Um, we have different techniques we could have used and, and should have used. And so the first thing you need to do is, is get in the emotion of the people who are bringing the issue. So we got into the emotion. So on behalf of the city, I said, we're sorry. This is an incident that shouldn't have happened. The second thing people want to know is, will it happen again? So then I talked about the training and the policies and the things we put in place to make sure it didn't happen again. We have other ways to get people to change in their clothes. We can just lock them up for a while. We can bring in a female guard that can help them dress. Um, so we have other ways to do it. So it's important to listen to what you're hearing and then represent the city. So if you saw the headline in the Olympian the next day, city manager apologizes for taser incident. So another part of my job is to respond on behalf of the city in incidents like that that aren't nearly as, uh, as fun as the grand opening. Let's see. Um, Oh, one of, one of the other things I had to think about in preparing for the taser incident was so, I, so we're in an active lawsuit, and so there's litigation going on. So I had to plan for that. What can I say that won't jeopardize the litigation because we're being sued? I had um, the political aspect. My council members are freaking out because they're all being pointed at. Why did you let this happen? And then I had the, uh, my own employees. I didn't want to give up my employees. Actually, in this case, the employees were acting under the policy in place at the time. Our policy says if somebody doesn't cooperate, you warn them, you warn them, you warn them, you zap them. Well, we need to change policy. So I, wanted, I didn't want to throw my employees under the bus either. So you kind of had to weave the statements in that looked at the political issues, the legal issues, and the employee motivation issues and put them all together. So that's part of the planning for what you're going to say, even if it's just a short presentation like that. Um, I mean, we want extemporaneous. A lot of my job is extemporaneous. I'll, I'll, you know, I'm at the YMCA and somebody wants me to talk about the city or something like that. And so you can kind of just blow those opportunities off and say, oh, blah, blah, blah. But it, you know, every time you get a chance to communicate an idea, a message, you need to take that. And especially if you're representing an organization or your business or, or, or whoever, 
take advantage of that opportunity to, to send a message. So March 14th, um, I'm at the uh, celebration of 100 years of public ports in the state of Washington. And um, it's in a giant warehouse at, uh, in downtown Olympia. And uh, it's colder than heck. They have this warehouse is not heated. And there are a few hundred people there, and the governor's going to speak. And so everyone's um, shivering, waiting for the governor to speak. And she gets done, and the crowd kind of dissipates. They go toward the heaters so they're on the edge of the building. So I thought, oh, there's the governor. I got a chance to talk to the governor. So I quickly have to think, OK, what do I want to say to the governor? Here's the governor standing there shivering. And um, what do I want to say to the governor? So um, there's messages to be sent. And when you're representing an organization, agency, send them. So the first thing I want to let the governor know, I got 30 seconds with her. Her security guy was doing this. I got 30 seconds. So I went up and introduced myself. And really what I wanted to let her know is Olympia is here. The capital city is here. We're glad you're here. Of course, she lives here. But I wanted to know the city of Olympia is here. Second thing is we care about what's happening. I said to her, I said, you know, you guys are facing a tough mess up there. I really don't envy with all the decisions. So I made an empathetic appeal to who she was and what was going on. And third, I made a personal appeal. I said, you know, if there's anything the city can do to help during this time, except money, uh, let us know. Because, you know, we're here. We're proud to be the host city. So I got 30 seconds to send some messages. So a lot of what I do now is having to think quickly about what messages I want to send. So I told the governor, we're here. The city of Olympia is here. We care about what's going on. And if there's anything we can do to help, let us know. So hopefully, and the governor said, wow, you guys are doing some great things in Olympia. So that cemented in her head that the host city is really on the ball. So a lot of what I do is extemporaneous speaking, where I've got to, on the spur of the moment, kind of come up with something that's, um, that's representing my agency. OK, the next one. Uh, any questions, comments about that? That's a hard one for me. It's, um, and uh, you, you kind of. You kind of get better at it as you practice. I'm going to tell you at the end, practice, practice, practice. Because I, I have, in my career, have not been a real comfortable public speaker. But over the years, I've just practiced it. And um, a lot of it is the communication you have informally with people in your teams. That's really important. I mean, don't, don't blow that off. That's really good practice. Also with your peers, at parties, wherever you get a chance to speak. Think about what you're going to say and say it. So practice is really important. Another kind of speaking I do a lot is persuasive speaking, where I need to persuade somebody about something. I'm involved in labor negotiations. I have seven unions at the city, so we do a lot of persuasive speaking there. Uh, I'm invol involved in policy, where I'm trying to, um, to develop a policy, and I need to work with the business community or a neighborhood about a particular policy or a new law. I work with the city council. A lot of it is I'm selling. I'm out there selling stuff. This is what I think we ought to do. This is where I think we ought to move. I'm trying to convince people. One of the best examples of that uh, was 2005. And um, I got a chance to go to the JFK School of Public Affairs at Harvard. And so if any of you have ever been there, it's, it's fab. I have this Harvard sweatshirt. And so people ask me now, did you go to Harvard? I said, yeah, this really went. I said, well, just long enough to get the sweatshirt. But I went to Harvard. <laughs> so I've got my Harvard sweatshirt. But I got a chance to speak at the JFK School of Public Affairs at Harvard. And it wasn't just, um, just in a classroom like this. It was actually this giant, if you've been to Harvard, they have what's called the round. And it's a stage. And um, there's a, a, the audience literally surrounds you. And probably about 200 people surround you on the stage. And then there are two more levels. There's two more mezzanines where the same thing. They kind of look down. And so when you're speaking, it's kind of like you're in the old Colosseum. You know, you're waiting for them to unleash the lions and come after you. But it's a really spectacular place. The reason I was there is that we were a finalist for uh, an award called the Innovations in Government Award. And so the city of Olympia and I think 20 some other agencies were invited to Harvard to make this presentation on the most innovative government, state, local, county governments in the country. So we were with some really good competition, some really great people. And the prize was $100,000 for your city. If you won this competition, $100,000 for your city, plus a lot of prestige. And so to, to determine who won, they had this expert panel. It was panel. It was like, uh, these people are too old for you to remember. But I don't know if anyone knows David Gergen, ringing any bells. David Gergen is a senior political analyst for CNN. 
Uh, he's about 100 years old, but he was, a, he was an advisor to the White House for the Nixon administration, for the Reagan administration, and the Clinton administration. So think about those weird politics. So he advised three presidents, and now he's a CNN correspondent. He was one of the panelists. There were about 10 people like David Gergen. Then there was David Osborne. Ever, anyone ever read Reinventing Government? It was kind of a Bible for city managers back in the 90s. So David Osborne uh, and Ted Gabler wrote Reinventing Government. So uh, David Osborne is on this panel and about eight other people that are equally impressive in this area. So they were the group that was going to decide who got the prize, who won the $100,000. So very different scenario where we had a lot of time to think about, a lot of time to prepare, and we kind of got one shot at this award and this prestige. So the keys there for me were prepare. We really had to prepare. Uh, we got one shot back in Harvard, and so we, we spent a ton of time preparing what we were going to say. Now we were trying to, this is kind of technical, we were trying to sell um, what we call a 100-year capital facilities planning process. So, so capital facilities in my world are like roads and sewers and bridges. And part of the issue in public administration is you're always replacing them, they're always wearing out. And so we talked about how to put in place a 100-year CFP cycle so that we built things to last. Now, not necessarily last 100 years, but made them easier to repair, easier to patch, easier to correct over the 100-year period. So it's pretty innovative uh, um, approach. And there was actually a team of people. There were probably four or five people who worked on this. And so the public works director and I were the spokespeople for our, for our project. So we really had to plan and prepare. And this is where group work comes in really well. The four or five of us met for, I don't know, probably six or seven weeks before the presentation, continuing to understand and hone the presentation and getting all the ideas on the table. And then the public works director and I had to spend a lot of time figuring out what he'd say and what I'd say. And so we actually hired a speech coach. Um, there's a guy named Michael Bushmull. And Michael Bushmull is um, just an amazing man. He's been a consultant to. Um, political officials, business people all over the world. He's now spending most of his time in China. He, um, he wrote a book on um, PowerPoint, and it got translated to Chinese, so now he's a big wig in Chinese. He used to consult on the Merv Griffin Show. Anyone ever heard of the Merv Griffin Show? No? My examples aren't working anymore, Jeff. There is. It's, uh, no, everybody's, everybody's too young. And you know, Merv Griffin used to be a talk show way before Oprah, way before Jerry Springer, there was Merv Griffin. So there's no fighting on the Merv Griffin Show, though. So. So anyhow, so he's this consultant. So we actually hired Michael Bushmull to come, and he videotaped our presentation, and then we watched ourselves and made corrections. So when you get a chance to make a big presentation like that, practice, work with your presentation partner, get coaching. In this, in this instance, we'd videotape it, and we'd look at ourselves and go, that's pretty dorky. So, so we got a chance to really practice. So we prepared, we practiced, and then we had to be ready, especially with um, especially with our, our presentation partner. The last thing is, because this panel of really smart people is going to ask us questions, we really had to know our stuff. You couldn't bluff it. Sometimes you can make a presentation kind of kind of bluff your way through. But this panel spent about a half an hour grilling us afterwards. So once our presentation was done, um, they went after us with questions. So we really need to know our stuff. So when you've got a big presentation like that, practice, prepare, uh, make sure you know your topic. Those are really helpful. Any questions about that? We lost. We didn't, we didn't win. We didn't lose. We didn't win. How's that? So, but um, it was a really great experience. I can't remember some, there was some shoo-in in California. They had some political insight. That's, we, that's the excuse we made, but uh, some group in California won. They actually had a good project. I don't remember what it was. But we did go to the Red Sox game that night, so it wasn't a total loss. So, so those are the four kinds of speaking that I do quite a bit of. Um, again, the ceremony or representing the city. I didn't give you an example of motivational, but you can imagine in my job motivational speaking whenever I lay out my budget message for my employees, the extemporaneous and then per persuasive. So um, I wanted to share just a few things that I've learned um, over 30 years. I've been in public administration now 30 years. And um, I started out up at Western Washington University got a degree in public administration, um, worked for a nonprofit organization for three years, and then went to Washington State University and got a graduate degree <clears throat> in public administration. 
So I've had a lot of chances to, to practice now communication and public presentation. Um, but a lot of what I've learned came from mistakes that I made. And so uh, a friend of mine used to always say, you know, yeah, um, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. So you do things that don't quite work, and you kind of learn a lot from those. So I thought I'd share just a couple fabulous flops of mine that really just fell flat in terms of public communication and speaking. The uh, first one is when I worked with a nonprofit organization. I was um, 23 years old, I think. And I worked for a nonprofit out of Yakima. And what they did was they developed um, low income and farm worker housing all throughout the state of Washington. And a lot of times, these weren't very popular. There were, there were um, biases and bigotry about farm worker housing and about low income housing. So my job was to find a location for this housing so people could have a decent place to live. So in about 1980, I'm at the Grandview City Council. And Grandview's oh, 20 miles south of Yakima in the, in the agricultural valley. And they desperately needed farm worker housing. There were a lot of farm workers living in pretty bad conditions. And so as a 23-year-old person, I was going to go in there and sell, sell, sell about how important this was and get the city council to agree to it and build some housing for people who needed it. What I didn't do is I didn't gauge the audience, or, and I didn't listen. So I arrive at the Grandview City Council uh, council chambers, and there's an angry mob. It's an overflowing mob. They're, they're angry. They don't want farm worker housing. They don't want low income housing. They don't want poor people in their town or in their neighborhood. And so I didn't catch those nonverbal cues, you know, like, like the shaking fist and the pitchforks. You know. I didn't catch those nonverbal cues. So I came in to make my canned presentation. First mistake. Um, so I start, and, and second, I was just trying to sell, sell, sell. I was trying to win. I was trying to get the council who were sitting up here to win. So I'm making my presentation like this, and the crowd's getting angrier and angrier. And at one point, the mayor says to me, he goes, come here, young man. He says, I think you may want to turn your back to us and face the audience. So I went like this, and suddenly I realized what I'd done wrong. I wasn't listening to these people. I didn't hear these people. And he also said that because he thought they were going to throw me out of the room. So we, I ended the presentation, and the council tabled the issue. And so for the next several months, my job was to talk to these people and to help them understand what we were doing and what we weren't doing. Now, not everybody agreed, but I started listening, started understanding the issues. And then, only then, were we successful and were able to build that project. So that was a fabulous flop. <clears throat> another another presentation that didn't work out too well. And this one happened just like two or three summers ago. So you know, you still make mistakes. You still learn things. Um, sometimes you give very technical presentations. Um, and, we, and so I rely a lot on PowerPoint. And so do you guys use PowerPoint? And you got the template. You know, it's easy to put stuff in. It's really a useful tool, but it can also be kind of a crutch. And so I was making a PowerPoint presentation to the Washington City County Managers Association. So there are about 120 city managers and county managers from around the state. And I was talking about some very technical stuff. So I loaded up on my PowerPoint. I was talking about different ways to raise revenue, voter approved revenues, like raising property taxes, sales taxes, this thing called a levy lid lift. They have different thresholds for voter approval. They have different technical details. So I loaded up all in the PowerPoint. I was ready to make this presentation. I'd gone through it, rehearsed it. Well, I get there, so room, you know, three times as big, and the PowerPoint didn't work. And the, and the CD I brought along or the DVD I brought along didn't work either. So now I've got this technical presentation, and there's no way to convey the information. So I didn't do two things. One, I didn't have a backup. I should have had handouts or something. And then two, I hadn't simplified the concepts enough to be able to present like this. And so the presentation just got lost because I didn't have a backup plan. And I didn't have a simple way of describing what had happened. So I spent about 20 or 25 minutes mumbling about something. So, so when you get those technical presentations, just be ready. You know, if, the, if it doesn't work out, if your power goes or you don't, your PowerPoint doesn't work, you're in trouble. So I was in trouble. So that's another one. So a couple of flops I've learned from those. Um, main, main lessons for me, um, again, Public speaking is, and communication is such an important part of my job. I've been in this business now uh, almost 30 years. And every day, my job is to communicate. Every day, I am in a public speaking arena of some kind. So 
know your audience. Think about your audience in advance and listen to them before you even meet them. Listen to who they are. You know, are they a group of students uh, in Jeff's class here at Centralia College? Um, are they an angry mob of people in Grandview? Are there people waiting for the City Hall grand opening just so they can get cake and go into it? Listen to your group before you get there. Watch for those nonverbal cues that are happening. As soon as you walk in a room, you can see that, and you need to be able to adjust. So know your audience. Um, know your topic. Uh, one of the things I was looking at your course outline says, well, how do you deal with it you know, when you're a nervous speaker? Well, if you know what you're talking about, it really helps if you know what you're talking about to be able to stand up and speak to people. And another technique I use, I tell stories a lot. I, you know, if, if I ask any of you, what did you do for Thanksgiving? Who came? What did you eat? You could all sit there and tell me a story because you know, it's natural. You, you know, here's what happened at our Thanksgiving. Here's what's important about it to me. So, so tell stories that will help people connect with ideas. And then always have a clear message. Think about what it is you want to convey. If I just want to say hi to the governor, I can say, hey, Gov. But if I want to convey a message about you know, the capital city and the connection to the governor, I want to think about what I'm going to say to her to leave a message with her. And then finally, um, practice, practice, practice. Every opportunity you get, because I think that'll really help in your communication in groups, in front of, uh, in front of people. Um, keep doing that. So that's a little bit about how I've survived 30 years in public administration, a little bit about what I do. So I am happy to answer questions or hear your comments. Yes. Um, 21 years now. I started as the assistant city manager in 1990. I was the assistant for 13 years and then got the city manager job eight years ago. Yeah, I never thought I'd stay that long. Olympia is a pretty cool place. I thought I'd be there four or five years. 21 years later, I'm still there. Yeah, Jeff? Camp Quixote? Oh, okay, this this is a this is a really uh, interesting. So, homelessness is a problem, you know, nationally and certainly in the state of Washington, certainly in Thurston County and Lewis County. And so, um, I don't know how many years ago, six or seven years ago, a group of homeless advocates decided to take it on their own to find a place for the homeless. So they set up camp in a parking lot in downtown Olympia, and they established, they kind of took over ground and said, we need a place for these people to be, and they created a tent city in downtown Olympia. And so as the city manager, my job is to figure out how to deal with that. So we're getting, we're getting calls from adjacent business owners. They're not happy. Here we've got a bunch of homeless folks with all their trappings right across the street from the business district. Um, there's sanitation issues. There's noise issues because at night they've started, some of the folks in the camp started partying. So there are noise issues. So, um, so part of what we did is we started working with you know, again, listening to the advocates, figuring out what we needed. And we created a model called Camp Quixote. And what Camp Quixote is, it's kind of a traveling tent city that allows um, the homeless, with support from other people, to establish temporary tent cities on the grounds of local churches throughout the community. And so it's a, it's a model that has some rules to it. As a matter of fact, the Camp Quixote people are much more strict than the city would ever be. But it creates a safe, um, somewhat sheltered environment for people who don't have homes. So the tent city has now been traveling through Olympia for about five or six years to different churches around our community. They've gone to Lacey once. Lacey allows them as well, Tumwater in the county. So it's, um, you know, it was, it's something that started out bad. We had to move them out of downtown, but it turned out to be a really good model for helping to house a certain slice of the homeless who have nowhere else to go. We do a lot of fun stuff at the city of Olympia. What other questions or ideas do you have? You can ask any. You can ask about port protests, whatever you like. I'm sure Ralph had much better stories last week when he was here. He's a pretty amazing guy. Jeff and I know Ralph really well. And he's really amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah. There, that's a really that's a really good question. There are 
a lot of issues that we try and deal with at the local level that are really statewide or national, and those are the ones that are the hardest to deal with. So like homelessness, um, like poverty, like food, shelter issues. And it's not a core service for us. We try and do it on the side, and we never can seem to do enough. So Olympia tends to attract those social service problems because we were the capital city and because we were the core. And um, you know, my job, I'm trying to keep the roads operating, trying to keep the sewers running, trying to keep enough police on the streets so neighborhoods are safe. And so to try and divert services to health and, um, and homeless issues and uh, food issues is really difficult. So that's always been a challenge. And it's, and it's not a problem for Olympia, but we have a very activist community. And so they have high expectations about local government. And even though you know, we're relatively small in comparison, there are high expectations. And so a lot of times it's hard to say what, what, what are the priori priorities for the community. And each group coming forward wants to say this is a priority or this is a priority. So the activist community keeps us on our toes. But you know, I, I have friends who are in like small town in Kansas, literally. And I'll talk to them. I'll say, what's going on? Well, we're buying a fire truck. Pretty cool. And he says, well, so what do you work on? He goes, I'm, we're trying to decide what color the fire truck should be. I'm thinking, red's a pretty good color, but I'm not getting into this. So they'll have study sessions on the color of the new fire truck, right? Because it might be green this year. I'm going, OK. So I like the challenge. I like the excitement of Olympia, because we're always doing something on, on the edge. Anybody live in Olympia? OK. Good. You love it? Yeah? If there's one thing you could change, it would be? Not the city manager, that's not a choice. <laughs> that's not a choice. What's that? Roundabouts? You don't like them? Oh, I love roundabouts. <laughs> Most people your age like to go really fast than them, so. <laughs> what would you change? Uh, roundabouts. roundabouts, too? <laughs> I thought it was just old people didn't like them, so. And they're getting more and more of them now. Uh, Tumwater has three brand new ones on um, uh, Little Rock Road and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a big issue. We've got during our our analysis, we've got about ten, about eighty percent of people do roundabouts perfectly. Ten percent go too fast, and ten percent go too slow. And so those are the ones we get complaints about a lot. So this is an interesting public policy dilemma because if you look at the data, roundabouts can carry more about forty percent more traffic than a than a T-bone intersection. So they're very efficient, but they require public education. And so a lot of what we're still dealing with 10 years after our first roundabout is the public education aspect. And, that, and that's one of the challenges, too. I can sit here and give you all the technical data you want, but if you don't like them, you don't like them. You know? So until you get comfortable driving them, until we figure out the 10% are go too fast and the 10% are go too slow, they're a problem for some people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think I think so. We're a small city. We're a small capital city too. We're not like Des Moines or Denver. So I think that's absolutely true. People confuse the two, and you know, a lot of the protests and stuff we get in Olympia are because we're the capital cities. People want to make a stand there. So yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion. The other thing is, in the last couple of years. There's been a lot of negative media coverage of what's happening in Olympia. Well, in Olympia today, well, they're talking about the state, right? But, and it's in Olympia, in Olympia today, they did this stupid thing. Olympia Day, they did this stupid thing. And you're going, wait a minute, that was at the state capital Olympia. We're trying not to do stupid things at the city. So yeah, there's a lot of that confusion and expectation. OK.